I'm so happy because today I can share some very exciting news. After decades implementing and teaching cybersecurity, I've learned we can't wait for Jedi Knights to show up and secure our systems. There aren't enough security experts who wield their powers for good designing secure systems. Developing deep expertise will take time, time we no longer have. But they are not our only hope. There is another way. When I started at Microsoft, I very quickly learned that I couldn't scale to helping even those people who wanted help in a big product like Windows or even something relatively simple like Word. If we want secure systems, we must teach engineers what security means and how to do it. We have to find compelling and relatable ways to ensure that everyone has the same foundational knowledge. And this must include software engineers and project managers who aren't cybersecurity experts. In my decades of teaching, I found the answers often lie in stories from a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. Star Wars gives us a large and accessible set of examples. Concrete examples help people grasp complex ideas and being playful encourages creative thinking about threats and that leads to more secure design. That's why I'm excited to let you know that I'm writing Threats, What Every Engineer Should Learn From Star Wars. It's coming out this fall. In honor of Star Wars Day, I wanted to share four lessons from one of our favorite droids. Why can't the Jawas transfer ownership of R2 to Luke Skywalker? Let's review the scene. The droids, R2-D2 and C-3PO, have been captured by the Jawas, who have had time to insert a restraining bolt, whatever that is. I suspect it's some form of malware on a USB drive. But when the little red droid blows its stack and C-3PO suggests they take R2, what happens from a computer security point of view? Do the Jawas hand over a post-it with what they think is R2's root password? If I was buying a computer in a market, I'd want to reinstall the operating system. We never see either taking place, which is fine. I mean, it's a movie and all, but let's step past that to the question of what makes an administrator an administrator. With a traditional desktop computer, there's an administrative account that has complete operational control of the system, and it's usually protected with a password which can be bypassed with some special physical activity, like holding down a set of keys at boot. That's what makes admin admin. The power of that administrative account is changing because malware has been increasingly aggressive in transferring control of your system to the malware operators. So today, for example, Apple maintains strong control of what runs on iOS devices and increasingly limits what administrators are authorized to do on their own Mac OS systems. And I think something similar is involved with control over R2. In fact, Uncle Owen says, tomorrow I want you to take that R2 unit to Anchorhead and have its memory erased. That implies that erasing a droid's memory requires special equipment or skills, or at least some way to reinstall the operating system. I think the Star Wars answer is R2 owns R2. And when the Jawas install whatever they install, R2 forces it to install in a container, a virtual machine, or something like that, leaving the kernel intact. So in that case, the Jawas never have control over R2-D2 that they can transfer. There are two important concepts here. Authentication and authorization. Passwords are a form of authentication, and we'll come back to authentication in Chapter 2. But if we assume strong authentication, we can ask, what is a given account authorized to do? Can this account alter system files is a question of authorization. 
regular user accounts are not authorized. That authorization is implemented with access control, that is, permissions of some sort. Similarly, containers incorporate authorization limits, isolating what's in the container from what's outside of it. And to answer the question, control of R2 doesn't change because the Jawas were never authorized to take or give control of our little friend. For extra credit, number one, design a system for R2 to manage restraint bolts that could fool a dedicated Jawa inspector who can spend up to a week deciding if R2 is under their control. For the second chapter of this mini course, let's turn our attention to how R2-D2 authenticates Obi-Wan Kenobi. I'm going to assume that R2's memory has not been wiped and also that R2 is not in fact a force using droid. Now, it's obvious no one ever enters a password, but more, it's obvious that R2 has a depth sensing camera because it's used to record the holographic message. It's reasonable to use it for authentication, and in a way, R2 has the components needed for Face ID just like an iPhone. Also, that camera and display are shockingly better than the weapon targeting systems in the Millennium Falcon. Now, it's a bit different than Face ID because it works after nearly 20 years. Over 20 years, bones change. It turns out they change in predictable ways, and R2 has had a day or so to figure out how aging might impact his now old friend. The trickiness is that most biometric systems don't store raw information about things like bone structure. They process that raw data into what's called a template. It's a model, optimized so a new scan can be quickly compared to the template. And so R2 probably has to go back to memories of Obi-Wan, compute aging functions, and then generate a new template for use. Alternately, R2 could use the template with a much lower threshold for matching than would normally be used. Most biometric systems can be tuned in these ways, and so increasing the acceptable false accept rate might allow an older Obi-Wan to authenticate. Now, Authenticating humans to computers is a complex task. When we make demands that serve the technology, like use a long passphrase, they can be unreasonable. Perhaps he's forgotten it over 20 years. Great engineering focuses on the needs. In this case, delivering a crucial message to an old ally. Extra credit number two. Show the access control rule, Princess Leia writes, and explain how R2 parses it, and what dependencies it has. The next two chapters are prompted by the same scene. Having left the Millennium Falcon, our heroes find themselves in a control room, and R2 plugs into the Death Star. What's happening when that happens? We don't get a lot of information. R2 just goes ahead and reports the tractor beam has seven power couplings, any one of which is a single point of failure. With that knowledge, Obi-Wan heads out, and R2 beeps and C-3PO translates, saying, I found her, and keeps repeating, she's here. Speaking of single points of failure, it's sort of amazing that the Death Star can fire its cannon three times without blowing itself up, given how badly the rest of it is engineered. Let's start with R2 plugging in. We've talked about authentication and authorization, and both of those are important here, and I want to add another dimension. Is the interface port intended to act as a boundary between the Death Star and whatever plugs in? Is it like HDMI, which just works to display? Or like plugging a phone into a computer where you're prompted about trust? When different entities interact, there's a boundary between them. The boundary exists at a couple of different levels. There's an intellectual level. We think the things on each side are different. There's a technical level, perhaps a firewall or an operating system kernel that may help us enforce that separation. And then there's a policy level, the rules that are written and enforced at the boundary. When I look at threat models, I regularly see several kinds of problems with boundaries. 
no boundaries, confused boundaries, unenforced boundaries. And while we don't see it in the movie, it certainly seems that the Death Star engineers failed to identify these boundaries or enforce anything. Identifying and then enforcing these boundaries is really our only hope. In the same scene, when R2 has plugged in in the control room, what steps are required to find the detention cell block? Maybe R2 was doing a search and found there were detention blocks and then queried each for contents. He gets back not only a list of names, but plans for termination? I'm not going to say this is the most unbelievable part of a story that includes Jedi Knights, lightsabers, and hyperspace drives, but anyway, from a certain point of view, it's worth asking, what defenses could have turned Star Wars into a tragedy? First, there's authentication. Why can R2 run queries before he authenticates? There might be good reasons to minimize authentication controls for basic functions like floor plans, but what about the list of prisoners? Maybe there should be an intrusion detection system that alerts on queries about high-value prisoners. But maybe, just maybe, this isn't so unbelievable at all. Maybe it's part of a rapidly crafted plan to allow the princess to be rescued. The same plan that puts a tracking device on the Falcon. In that case, maybe R2 only ever connects to a honeypot deception network. For extra credit, what defensive technologies could have made for a much sadder movie? Consider the pros and cons of various controls that the Death Star might have deployed. Like the assumption R2 can only run code because only authorized users can plug into the Death Star, maybe it's easier than authorizing a million people to just let anyone run that code. What arguments exist against other controls? Now, can you feel the power of these analogies? I'm really excited about this book. And if you are too, please sign up for updates about it at threatsbook.com. Second, if you're excited and want early access to some of the content, I'm looking for beta readers who will read drafts of some of the trickier chapters over the summer and give me feedback. Lastly, if you want to test your skills by answering the extra credit questions, there's a couple of ways to submit your answers, and I'll be giving away five inscribed copies of the book for the best ones. You can submit your answers by commenting on LinkedIn, or there's a version of this course at courses.showstack.org. And if you go there, you can also explore other courses I'm teaching. Thank you, and may the fourth be with you.